Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. Well, today we're going to talk about cereal ports. You know, we all tend to wax a bit nostalgic about the good old days when things were simpler and better. And we say things like, oh, you don't need that overcomplicated USB stuff. All you need is a good old fashioned cereal port. Well, the thing is, our rose colored glasses kind of hide the whole truth from us. Getting a serial port connection set up on vintage computers can be quite the chore. It's not always as straightforward as you would think. On our modern devices like Arduinos, they've got a lot of processor power, they've got a big serial buffer, and it kind of hides some of the complication from us. I've struggled many times in the past getting a serial connection set up between two devices, and I've done so again in the last few weeks. So I thought I would do this video about serial ports and getting vintage computers set up and talking to each other. So let's get started. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. They not only do PCBs and flex PCBs, they also have 3D printing service, injection molding service, they do CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, they also have a thriving maker community where you can share projects and check out what other people are doing. For your next project, head on over to PCB Way. First, let's talk about what a serial connection is. Back in 1960, RS-232, that is Recommended Standard 232, was introduced by the Electronic Industries Association as a standard for serial communication. This uses some seemingly funny signal levels of minus 15 volts for a 1, also called a mark, and plus 15 volts for a 0, also called a space. The modern standard allows for these voltages to vary from minus 15 to minus 3 and plus 15 to plus 3, although older RS-232 equipment may be unhappy with the lower voltage levels. Reliable transmission over longish distances given the tech of the day, these voltage levels made perfect sense. Comparatively, today Ethernet uses plus and minus one volt. Serial communication is sort of like Morse code. You're sending a code of marks and spaces, or dots and dashes, one after the other. That is, you're sending individual bits in a series. Groups of these bits make up a single character. The most basic form of serial communication is just three wires, transmit, receive, and common. Of course, there are several other signals in the RS-232 standard. These are the handshaking signals, which allow the computer, called DTE, Data Terminal Equipment, and DCE, Data Communication Equipment, to let each other know that they are ready to talk. A quick way to remember the DTE, DCE terminology is to remember that DTE stands for Data Terminal Equipment. The terminal is the thing with the screen, the computer that you're typing into. DCE is the communication equipment, i.e. the modem, or the thing you're talking to. If you look at a vintage computer, you will probably find a huge 40-pin IC that does nothing but a few basic serial communication tasks. This chip, called a UART, a Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter, is responsible for the serial communication and it may or may not have the handshaking signals incorporated into it. Many times the computer has to use other I.O. pins for these functions. To make it even more fun, the UART typically only has a one byte transmit and receive buffer. The computer must remove a newly received byte when it is ready and place it in a buffer and RAM before the next incoming byte clobbers it. The computer must also monitor and twiddle the handshaking lines via software. The UART chips have a TTL signal level, that is 0 to 5 volts, so you also need a plus and minus 15 volt supply and level converters or line driver chips to get the proper RS-232 signal levels. The handshaking signals were also used on vintage systems in a variety of ways. Perhaps only RTS and CTS were used. Perhaps DTR and DSR were also used, and the computer or device it is talking to expect these signals to all be twiddled in a certain manner. 
to complicate things even further. Not every vintage computer chose to use the same gender of connectors, the same size connectors, or even to wire them according to the standard. Different devices may require a minimum amount of time between characters and or between lines. It can get very complicated to get a simple serial connection working. Wow, what a mess. The first struggle is often figuring out how to connect one device to another. What should the wiring look like? And while the RS-232 standard has been widely published for decades, that doesn't mean every manufacturer actually followed the standard. Sometimes they swap the connector genders. Uh, most of the time you'll find a, a female connection on the, the computer, IBM's liked using a male to differentiate it from the parallel port. Uh, sometimes it's a DB25, sometimes it's a DB9. The DB9's tend to be male. Uh, some devices, instead of having a DB9 on it, might have a DIN plug like this for CGP115. Uh, this Epson has an RS-232 port that is a DIN plug, and it also has a serial port, which is a TTL level, and these two things are used for different purposes. That adds to the confusion. And you have computers like the Sinclair Z88, which has a DB9 that's wired in a non-standard way, which is just evil. And when you look up the RS-232 connections, uh, a lot of times you'll get uh, not enough information and sometimes too much. You don't want to treat this on every aspect of the communication standard. You just want to know how to wire things up. So I made up my own little chart here, which shows the names and purposes of each signal, the description it normally goes by, the direction from the standpoint of the DTE, the computer, and DCE, your device you're wanting to talk to, and what those pins are for a DB25 and DB9. This is a good point to point out, there's really no such thing as a DB9. Uh, the D refers to the shape of the connector. It is D-shaped. Uh, the 9 refers to the number of pins, 9 or 25. The letter here, the second letter, refers to the shell size. So this is actually a B size and this is an E size. So this is technically a DE9, but if you ask for a DE9 connector, some people are going to look at you like you have two heads. So even though it's not technically correct, I used DB9 on here. I also did not uh, dictate connector genders because like I said, it can be different from equipment to equipment or even state what those were on various manufacturers' equipment, because whatever you've got, you're going to have to look it up, because you'll wind up with silly stuff like this. So now we're ready to wire things up. We need to make a cable to hook our serial port to some device. What do we do? How do we go about that? Well, fortunately, with the Internet these days, we can find out a lot of information. We can look up the standard RS-232 pinout, that sort of thing. Um, I also have this book, I think this was printed back in the 90s, and it has a whole section in here about the standard pinouts for the 25 pin and 9 pin serial connectors. Uh, if you're going from computer to printer, computer to a terminal, in other words a null modem cable, and uh, different wiring for different things like a standard Hewlett Packard wiring. Um, this one confuses me a little bit. I'm not sure what it is. It says DB25 at computer second, DB25 at printer standard PC. So not sure what that is, but this is still a handy reference even with the internet. Now, so we're going to wire something up. As an example, um, I bought this cable here because it had the right ends on it, uh, a male DB25 and a four pin DIN uh, to use on a uh, TRS-80CGP115 printer. 
I paid the princely sum of $5 for it at Tandy Assembly. And in looking up the CGP 115 service manual, I find it says that the interfaces RS-232 serial, so we know it's RS-232 signal levels, not TTL, 600 baud using data and busy. Well, okay, so we're using non-standard names, not data. That's going to be the TX line, the transmission line out of our computer, and not busy. What in the world is that? But there's nothing on here about 7 bits or 8 bits or parity or stop bits or anything like that. Further back in the service manual, it does give us the pinout of the connector. But there's no indication here if we're looking at the front of the connector or back of the connector. Um, if we hold the connector up like this, we can see it looks like our offset is opposite of here. So I'm thinking maybe this is uh, the back of the connector. If I have the right connector here, I think so. I hope so. Um, and it also shows us our signals here. Since we're just sending from the computer to the printer, we're not receiving anything from the computer. We just have what they're calling not data. Or this is the TX line, the transmission line from the computer. Ground, our common. And not busy, which I'm guessing is going to be CTS. So uh, this is a line, it's an output from the printer saying, hey, I'm busy printing, don't send me any more data right now. So the, we need to make sure the computer isn't going to send uh, information faster than the printer can uh, receive it. We also need to make sure that the computer is going to monitor the CTS input uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. And finally, if we look in the user's manual, it does give us the specifics of the serial port. It confirms it's RS-232C using data. Again, transmit, busy. We think that's CTS. 600 baud, 7-bit character, no parity, 2 stop bits. So now we should have the information we need to hook it up, but we're kind of guessing as to what busy is. And this is a situation we find ourselves in a lot where we have all the information we can get and we're about 90% sure and we'd a lot rather check it out before committing solder to connectors. So then what? Well, that's where things like this breakout box come in handy. I've had this one for years. Uh, it has a DB9, DB25, female and male. And... Pin 1 through 9 of the DB9 go through 1 through 9 here. 1 through 25 go through 1, one through 25 here. Uh, so the idea is you can hook up either connector and it's just passed straight through. If we need to do some rewiring, we can disconnect that pass through like this by shutting off these switches. And use some jumper wires. Non-broken jumper wires. Uh, to rewire things like that. We can make sure we've got our wiring down pat and then we are ready to go and we can solder up a connector. Now there are cases like if you're making a null modem cable where you need to hook a couple pins together. What do you do then? Well conveniently this has some jumper blocks here and if we need to hook six and eight together, we can do this. Now we've got six and eight hooked together on this side and we can hook it to the connection we want over here like that. Very convenient. I use this guy a lot figuring out connections. Uh, you can also get little boxes like this, which is just a circuit board with jumpers in here. So once you figured out something on here, you know, for a different sort of connector, you can make an adapter like this. This one happens to be a DB25 null modem adapter. I use this 
to make a DB25 to DB9 null modem cable. Um, I had such a cable here, and you can see I've got X written all over it because this guy, even though it says no motor right there, this guy is not wired right. It's a piece of junk. It's not useful for anything. It only works about half. If you run into a situation where you've got uh, non-matching or non-plugging genders, you can get gender adapters like this, male to male, female to female. So if you need to plug in two female things, you can do that. Two male things, you can do that. Uh, you can get adapters that go uh, DB25 to DB9, but you got to be careful that they're not futzing with any of the wires. I've got an adapter like that, and of course they futz with the wires. It's not a standard RS-232. I don't know what it's for. It makes it kind of useless. So let me get zoomed in on here, and we'll see how we would go about setting this up to do a DB9 to DB25 type of an adapter. Okay, so we're going to make a DB9 to DB25 adapter. Uh, I've got the chart here. We've got all the signal names over here. We've got the DB25 pins, the DB9 pins. So I'm going to slide this like this so we can see everything. And we are going to go ahead and shut off all our switches because we're not passing anything straight through like that. Okay. And the first thing is we go from DB9 pin 4 to DB25 pin 20. See, this isn't real difficult to do. DB9 pin 1. DB25 pin 8. 6 to 6. Oh, I guess that one is straight through, so we can just turn him back on. Uh, 9 to 22, 9, 22, 7 to 4, 7, oops, another broken wire. So the problem with these DuPont jumpers is they're cheap, but they're cheap. They break very easy. 7 to 4, 8 to 5. And five to seven. I am short one jumper wire, so we'll pretend we'll go five, two, seven. Like that. So now we've made a DB9 to DB25 adapter. And if we didn't have one, and we can test things out. And if we wanted to, we can use the bottom part of this chart. and make a DB9 to DB25 null modem cable. So we can start on our DB9 side here. We want to go from DB9 to DB25. And we would go the shell of DB9 to pin 1 of DB25. That's the frame ground. Pin 3 of DB9 to pin 2 of DB25, etc. So we take Connector 1, connector 2, we do the wires, and we've got some of these that are joined together, so we've already seen how to do that with the blocks on there. These guys are very, very handy. The other thing they're handy for, even if you don't need to manipulate the wiring on the signals, I'll often use this with everything straight through like this. So I can monitor a signal very easily, connect this and... this up to the scope to monitor the transmission line, something like that. It's very handy for that. So you just set one device to this side, you know, here to here, pass it straight through, and you're ready to go. Yeah, I just broke another pin. These are very cheap connectors. We took a look at this cable I bought before to connect the CGP-115 um, up to something that can print by serial, like uh, the Sharp PC-1500 through the RS-232 interface. I took a look at how this is wired, and 
We just have four wires hooked to the four pins on the DIN connector, which, you know, you can't mess that up. Um, on the DB25 end, it is very odd. It doesn't really match anything. Um, so I think what we'll do is just cut these wires off of here, get rid of this duct tape mess, and um, we'll plug these in uh, one, two, three, four, uh, like they are on, on the list here. Then we'll use some jumper wires to wire it over to the DB25 side and then test it out. Okay, let's see what we can do about this mess of a cable here. I'm going to kind of cut everything back to the length of the white wire. And having some wire left on the connector will make it easier to remove those later. There we go. Of course, now I've got sticky all over my hands. And huh, interesting, this cable has the green and white wire all by itself. And, oops. That is twisted the other way. And the red and black are separately shielded. Okay, I'm going to prep this cable and um, just kind of speed up the video so you guys aren't bored. So what I did was clean up the way this end was made, uh, crimped the shield down tighter, and added some heat shrink there just to make it a little stronger. And now according to the map I made, after looking at the connector with the wire colors, I'm going to try to poke these in here. Okay, so we've got uh, white goes into one, green goes into two, black goes into three, red goes into four. And that matches our color code right there. And I've made a list here uh, with the DB25 pin numbers I think these ought to go to. That is based on this sheet. So, try to get everything here where you can see it. I've turned all the pass-through switches off. Okay, I've got some of the cheap, crappy DuPont jumpers. And here is the first problem with my brilliant plan. I can't plug anything in there. Mm -hmm. I did not think of that. Okay, plan B. I poke the wires in the DB9 side here. I've got some jumpers coming from pins 2, 3, and 4, which are our relevant signals here. And pin 2, which is listed as not busy. I think that is CTS. So that's going to go to pin 5 on the DB25. Pin 3 is ground. That'll go to pin 7. And uh, pin 4, data, that's going to go to TX, which is pin 2. So, should be like that. Now I'll get the computer and stuff set up, which is over there. And uh, I've got some pins in the printer, and we'll see what happens. Okay, we've got everything set up. The printer's on. I have set the dip switches, so this should be in serial mode. I've not tested it before, so I don't know if the printer works in serial mode. It does work in parallel mode. We've got our cable set up through the breakout box. 
and we need to set the comp parameters on the sharp now. Uh, this will be hard for you to see, so I'll just let you know what I'm doing. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is set com 600 comma 7 comma n comma 2. So we're setting it to 600 baud, 7 data bits, no parity, and 2 stop bits. And then we're going to do set dev. DO comma PO, which should redirect uh, printing and LPrint and LList to the RS-232 port. And then we need to do out stat zero. This toggles the handshaking outputs uh, on the serial interface that go toward the printer, which it's not receiving anything, but this will let us easier do an instat. And it says zero, so uh, I think we, we might be okay to print. So I've typed in a short program, which just uh, prints a test message. So we'll try to run that and see what happens. And a big fat goose egg. Okay, so this is where you go back through and look at your documentation. It says pin four is data, four is red. And pin four, we have the brown wire. That needs to go to the transmit on our DB25, which is pin 2. Well, that looks correct. So we can check our uh, handshaking to see if that's working correctly. If we pull the wire from pin 2, which goes to pin 5, And then we do instat. We've got a four. So it is seeing the handshaking. So our common wire, wire must be right, which is going from pin seven to pin three. Three is black, that's ground. Pin seven is ground, okay. Uh, this actually turned out to be a good example of how a, you know, a simple serial connection is not always so simple. So, uh, we were getting no response from the printer, even though we thought we had our, you know, cable mocked up right. And I checked the dip switches on the printer, and the character set was set to JIS. I switched that to ASCII. And, um... Then got this. It was just printing gibberish. So then I connected uh, it to the PC, uh, making a DB9 to 25 adapter with the breakout box, and it printed fine from the PC. Uh, did multiple tests there. Everything was okay. Um, I played around with the character delay on the PC and found that if I did not have some character delay, in other words, it pausing briefly after sending each character, if I didn't have that character delay, it would goof up. Uh, that's because with the buffering that the uh, USB to serial converter does, it needs to have time to see the handshake signal set and react. So uh, it needs a few milliseconds of character delay. And so I went back to using the PC1500 CE158, again gibberish. I switched to the prototype CE158X, and it would print a single character. So at that point, I hooked up uh, my logic analyzer through an RS-232 
uh, level shifting board. This just takes the plus and minus, you know, 12 volt signals and converts them to logic levels. And with these really poor quality jumper wires, this whole thing is rather precarious. But this lets you see what's really happening. And once I did this, um, I'll pop it up here on the screen. Um, it looked like that the 158X was just stopping sending. Um, as soon as the first bit was sent and the printer uh, toggled the uh, CTS line, this just stopped sending. I thought that was rather curious. And then I found this in the manual which said that indeed the UART in here stops shifting bits out when RTS is uh, changed. So that was quite a uh, revelation. And then I switched to using uh, DSR. I kind of rewired this. So I'm using DSR instead of CTS. And indeed it works. Um, so it just goes to show you, you never know. Um, it worked with the original configuration uh, from the PC. Uh, but the way this UART works is a little different. And I think what's going on with the 158X is that because um, it takes uh, so long for the printer to respond because it's a rather slow printer that this times out. There's a timeout in the 158 ROM, which we have in here in a modified version. Um, it tries so many times to send a character and then gives up. So I think this is just timing out after the first character. So I'll have to look at the code in that. But now I thought we would uh, set this up so we can print from the sharp and I can show you the commands I typed in earlier from the above view. The printer's already on and it's printed its test squares. I'm going to turn on the serial interface. I'm going to turn on the computer. Now we need to set the COM parameters here. Set COM 600 7 in 2. And we'll do set dev uh, D O comma P O. This just redirects um, a list and uh, printing to go to the serial port. And we can check those by going com string. That looks right. Dev string. Okay. And now we need to set the outgoing handshake signals. Out stat. To zero. Okay, and one other thing we need to set is console, which is a funny name command. The first parameter sets the um, width of characters before a character turn is inserted. Zero sets it to unlimited. The zero one sets this to character turn line feed at the end of a line that's configurable separately for a parallel output if you have the sharp version and serial output. And we'll do that. And we'll type in run. This just is just a couple lines of basic that prints two different things. Now before I hit enter, I'll get you pointed at the uh, printer. Okay, I've tried to minimize the glare as much as possible. I'm going to hit enter. Yay, it prints, and that only took a few hours to figure out. <laughs> Here is a picture of the final uh, configuration of the DB25 side of the printer cable. We have the, the busy signal from the printer going to pin 6, which is DSR, and we have pins 4 and 5 just looped with each other, so we're looping back the request to send RTS from the computer to the CTS, the clear to send. So the computer is providing its own feedback there and everything works as we would expect. So even though it seems like that these handshaking signals are duplicated, uh, 
they actually work slightly different and they even work slightly different from device to device so sometimes we need to use one or the other or sometimes both which makes it even more confusing well it turns out that a simple serial connection really isn't so simple after all there can be a lot of pitfalls and you have to go back to reading the documentation on the UART and the various equipment, etc. Making up a custom cable. Uh, the breakout box is invaluable for this. Um, being able to use a simple uh, level shifter board like this and, and my cheap old logic analyzer to help figure that stuff out is great. Uh, previously, there were serial analyzers like this that was used professionally for that sort of thing. Um, you know, that then definitely would have been out of my budget, and now this is much more budget friendly as well. Uh, I've also used this setup to debug some software changes I made to the original uh, CE 158 ROM for the 158X. Uh, we added a uh, end of line uh, handshaking, so when you're downloading uh, ASCII programs. To your computer normally you need a two second end of line delay which gives it time to parse that line and tokenize it uh, which really makes downloading an you know um, an ascii program and you know text very very slow uh, so now whenever it sees the end of line character it changes the rts output of this and you know which the the computer sees is uh, cts and the computer will pause until it changes again. I was having a lot of problems with that and um, not able to figure it out. I couldn't quite capture it correctly with the scope. Uh, I saw something like this, which kind of gave me the hint that maybe it was still sending some bits even after the handshaking changed. And then when I captured it uh, with the logic analyzer, I could see that, yeah, it definitely was... Uh, sending some some bits there so i had to change the code and rework some things to uh, get that to work and now we've got the end of line to lay down to 100 milliseconds which makes downloading programs in ascii format a whole lot faster so um with some relatively simple tools and some work you can get serial connections on your vintage gear set up sometimes it's no problem a lot of times uh, it can be quite a headache because even though there was a standard, the RS-232 standard, um, you know, manufacturers tend to do things in different ways. Uh, as we saw with the um, UART in here, just decides to stop sending bits when CTS changes. Uh, the UART in the FTDI doesn't do that. Uh, the TI part system here doesn't do that. So... You never know. It can be quite confusing. Um, if you have any questions or comments, well, just let me know in the comment section down there below. I would love to hear from you. Thanks to everyone for helping support the channel. I really appreciate it. And until next time, bye.